So here's what we keep emphasizing. We've shown this slide like two or three times, I think. Probably means it's important. Horse shit on market. the left, pony on the right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can see it. You sort of see the image in, inside the, in the slide. But here's, the, here's, the, here's what we've been saying to you. And I hope you, I, I mean, I, I don't need you to believe me. Hopefully it works for you. That you don't really, there is an algorithm in, you, you know, in many aspects of what we've been talking about this quarter. But really, the most important thing to focus on, even if you are a PhD computer scientist or statistician, is to think about the input data and the output data. Now, in machine learning, it, you know, it's a little bit more complex. This is an oversimplification of kind of what's going on. But really, what you have essentially is a training data set. So you have lots of data. The more, the da more data, the better um, in this world of machine learning. With that training data, you, can, you, you don't have the algorithm at first. And what you're trying to do is sort of build that program that's going to do that prediction for you. And after you've learned an algorithm from all this training data, imagine it's images if you're trying to train uh, a computer to identify a cat, like you probably hear in the news. Well, you've got to give it lots and lots of images of a cat. And then from that data, you can create this, uh, this program. From that data, or once you have that data, then you can feed in real data. And so real data is not a perfect way of describing. Just think of this as you've got now your algorithm, and you're gonna, you've built your company, and you're going to go out and now identify cats. So you try it on real data, and you get some sort of output. Now, the learned algorithm aspect right here sometimes looks like this. In fact, it's a lot more complicated. This was a really nice um, an XKCD um, comic on the, uh, you know, sort of making fun of the, the complexities of these algorithms that are running these kinds of machines. And so here's a guide to medical diagnosis and treatment um, used by IBM Watson's computer system. So up here, you know, you draw some blood, you record patient's name, you measure height, weight, consult, uh, you know, consult the standard high weight chart, you go blah, blah, you go through all of this, you have weights on all of these different arrows. I think that's Theranos' business plan. Yeah, that could be, that's right. <laughs> Uh, that would be, an, we should have had that. That could have been a better slide, actually. Um, so this is, this is so essentially what's going on, well, much more complicated in some of these uh, deep neural net uh, algorithms. But just know that there is something complicated under there. But again, you don't really, it doesn't matter how complicated this is or even how effective you think the algorithm might be performing. You might spend a career developing algorithm you think is going to identify cats really well. But really, if your data going in are poor, your output's also going to be poor. Garbage in, garbage out. You give data that's poorly labeled, or you give data that doesn't represent what you're trying to identify, or you give it data that has noise, that doesn't represent um, what you want with your output, you're garbage in, garbage out. One of the, the standard ways of introducing machine learning and computer vision um, is to do a task. We do this in my class. Um, in my machine learning class, just like m most machine learning classes, you use the digit classification task as a way of explaining what machine learning is. So essentially what you're doing is you take these images, you take these pixel representations, uh, these, these grayscale values at these different pixels, and you create this big vector. You use that vector as a representation of that particular image, and then you can throw different algorithms at it. In this case, we typically start with something like nearest neighbors, and then you can develop some sort of distance metric. There's all sorts of different ways. You're basically measuring the distance from this particular vector to others that you're, uh, you're developing a classifier for. And so you have this algorithm. You have these methods for measuring, uh, measuring the distance. Um, and then um, you, you, you develop these. Uh, you develop these methods that you then apply on other kinds of problems. And you can then generalize, too, to uh, more, things more than just uh, uh, images and digits. But what happens, at least in machine learning, um, is that you get these great technologies, and then good stories start to, uh, well, interesting stories start popping out. So this is one of um, my favorite ones that uses some simple um, uh, text analysis. This was a, an XKCD, another XKCD, um, cartoon that represented a, um, uh, an analysis is w that was done by the, the cartoonist that put this together. And this is based on real data. And so the idea here was that the size of the number, the size of the number in this calendar represents the frequency in which it shows up in the Google Ngram project. So the Google Ngram project was pretty cool. This was a project in collaboration with libraries where they were scanning millions and millions of books all the way back to 15, 
or into to the um, uh, the 16th century and even well not can't go for the Gutenberg project, but it was scanning these millions of books and then pulling out what are called engrams. So engrams are just you know single words or double words next to each other through this sliding window. And after looking through this, you could then put in the dates, like April 1st or September 11th. You see here, September 11th is really huge. So you find September 11th, well, ele September 11th in this big corpus of books. You also see things like July 4th, and, and see up here in February, you see this tiny little February 9th, 29th. Sorry, what did I say? 29th. <laughs> and this started to capture the imagination of data scientists and the media that were, that were sort of uh, you know, chewing on what explained this really strange thing that was happening, which is look at 11 on all these other months except September 11th. See August, July, October, November, December. You kind of see it there. You certainly see it in these other months, definitely in February. What's going on there? So um, people started making up stories. Maybe people were avoiding the, the 11th in all of these books, in millions of books, because it was maybe like a 13 number. It was unlucky number. Or, or maybe there's something mysterious in the universe. People were getting mystical about this. The 11th, what is with the 11th? And we did have September 11th. What's going on? So uh, a really uh, one of the one of one of our favorite one of my more favorite forensic data um, exercises in the last couple of years was done by David Hagen, who wanted to look into this further. So he 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 thought, well, well, is you know, is this real? First of all, so he went and then he tr he he took the data from all these different um, months in this time period and looked over time to see whether this um, actually continued or whether it was a a, a relatively recent. Um, phenomena where you have the month of, or, or this day, the 11th, in such low frequency compared to everything else. You can see the 11th, it drops. And interestingly, it even it continues to drop more and more um, over time. So my question is, what's going on here? This is your chance to talk to your neighbor and figure it out. You've got, well, I'll give you one minute to see if you can sort out what could possibly be going on. Is it a real phenomena? Or is there another explanation? Go ahead and talk with your neighbor. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead. Does anyone want to raise their hand and give me some possible explanation for why they're seeing? And, and this, this, this didn't go quietly. There were a lot of really interesting explanations tying into comics and tying into religious text, tying into um, just, just numbers themselves. People were sort of pulling out number theory to try to explain this kind of work. And by the way, I'm not saying that any of them wouldn't have explained it well, but does anyone have another explanation? Yeah, so we were talking about how like an 11 can be confused for like two L's or something else in like a book. So maybe like the scanner could mess up for that and would have less data. We got some smart kids. You guys are, not kids, um, students. Um, <laughs> very smart students. Wow, you, you hit it right on. I was, I was thinking we would had to bounce around a little bit, but you got it. Well done. So did everyone hear that in the back? So. What was going on is Google was using optical characteristic, optical character recognition, OCR. But OCR is not perfect. Even if you're a, a, rich, a rich company like Google and, can, and, and buy the, the best technology out there, and what was happening is that the 11th was being confused for other things like N's and, uh, uh, and L's and all sorts of other things, and so it was getting washed out. So this very simple explanation to this beautiful, initially beautiful data science uh, or big data project where they were scanning all these books and finding all sorts of interesting things, and this is one thing that certainly popped out, was easily explained by the OCR. So simple explanations, um, are parsimonious explanations, uh, are generally um, better than the more complicated ones. Excellent job. So here's the thing. Coming back to this, data in, data out, you know, we talked a little bit in this case, the, the bad data might have been the OCR, which explains what's going on. You could explain that without knowing the algorithms for uh, the way they sort of scanned it and the technology itself of OCR. You just had to look at the data and the output and you could tell. Well done. But now let's look at sort of the output. So there's a lot of talk right now about the advancements in computer vision. 
And one sort of philosophical question, actually I remember as a kid always having it with my friends, is do you see the same color I do? Do you see the same baseball that I do? Um, whoa, that would be cool if you don't see the same thing. But now we can ask that sort of question between machines and humans. So here's how a human, I'm assuming you're all seeing the same baseball I am, right here. Do machines see the same baseball that you do? Well, there was, an interesting, there was some interesting work done at the University of Wyoming. There's an artificial intelligence lab that asked this question because there's been a lot of work that has shown that minor, minor changes like uh, in these images, really small things that you can't as humans perceive, hu like the, the machines will see it and it changes sort of the results. But there's another way of thinking about it. What happens if you, um, if you give it an image that you sort of evolved that has maybe similar features what happens um, to the machine? Would they still pick it up as seeing a baseball? And it turns out they do. So in their experiment, they found that the machine could identify, identified baseballs really up in the 90 percentile, sometimes 99 percent accurate. And if you gave it this image, it would also label that as a baseball with 99 percent um, accuracy. So they've done some work showing how you can easily fool these deep neural nets. So here, let me give you an example. So a school bus looks like this to the machine. If you look at a car, this is how it see, could see a car wheel. It would identify this as a car wheel. Um, here's a computer keyboard. Um, I'm not sure what, I think I could, well, I don't, I'm not sure I can pull that out at all. This one's really confusing to me. Here's a green snake. Um, here you have a vacuum. This is the one that's the most messed up to me. It's what my right. dog sees. That's why he yeah, just takes off it. every time. He goes running away from the vacuum. That's right. So the, the, they've, done a, they've done a bunch of work, um, and they've done this for lots of different kinds of features. Because these computer vision algorithms are doing a really good job at identifying these features. But we need to do exactly what this group is doing and show where, these, um, where there's variance and where it's completely off because, because these things are starting to drive our cars. And if they see a school bus like this or can see it like this, maybe, that's a, maybe it really is a feature set and that's fine. It doesn't matter. But I'm glad that people are running these experiments. But I'm hoping that there starts to be a little bit more o oversight on algorithms. And so that's kind of the point here with sort of calling BS in the age of big data. You're gonna, you're, you are the generation coming in, out, graduating um, from college, going out into industry in this world that is now the big data age. And I'm hoping that you start to question and start to push for things like oversight, not just of humans and things that we do in industry and as individuals, but also our algorithms.